So good evening. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and begin and um, begin the symposium for tonight. My name is Wade Smith. I'm one of the uh, Neurocritical Care Society members, and I'm proud to see so many people here. Each year it gets better and better, and I uh, hope you like the food. Please keep eating. There's plenty left. Um, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and, and begin a little bit of the discussion tonight. I think one of the topics, the main topic that we're focusing on here is cerebral blood flow. Daryl Gress, who is my mentor at UCSF, who's now at UVA, had taught me that we really, um, uh, in order to resuscitate the brain and to keep it healthy, we should really focus on cerebral blood flow. I think that that has been a goal long term, but I think one of our challenges is how the heck do you measure it? And I have a panel of people here tonight who really are world's experts in this, and I want them to share their biases and their interest in research in, in these directions. I want to thank our sponsor, um, Ornim, um, who was a, a platinum uh, or high, one of the highest, the highest level of donor for our society meeting. They have uh, an interest in this, uh, and I have a conflict with that in that I've been an advisor for Ornium since they began and their core technology is to look at cerebral blood flow. Um, my intent here is to be as objective as possible, uh, but I'd also encourage you to speak with uh, any of our device uh, manufacturers or here who have technology that's focusing on brain monitoring, including cerebral oxygenation and cerebral blood flow. Um, I'm gonna keep my comments to basic level to introduce the topics that uh, our esteemed colleagues here will go into in more depth. Uh, but basically, what I wanted to start with is, is blood flow to the brain. Why do we want it? Why do we care about it? And why do we need to monitor it? And I've already discussed uh, my relevant conflict. So hypoxemia or hypoxia, um, if you talk to the lay people, they're going to say, you know, someone got choked or someone got low on oxygen and that caused brain damage. Um, well, yeah, it can happen, but I think many of us here are very comfortable with the notion that it ain't just low oxygen, it's low blood flow that, it, that damages the brain. And so if I, I really put this into cartoon form, I've got a box here which is to represent your skull, a rigid structure. I've got one cell in there. Okay, maybe we have more than one. Um, but one cell that has mitochondria in it which produces our ATP. It has synaptic activity down to the lower left. It has sodium channels primarily for its, excitotox, its, its, its excitatory processes. And its main input function is the big red manometer on the left, which is your arterial blood pressure, and the venous outflow, which is pretty equivalent to intracranial pressure on the right. And the driving pressure into that box is the gradient between mean arterial pressure and ICP, which is equivalent to venous. Now, when, um, when the brain becomes hypoxic, so the O2 delivery itself is reduced, or at least oxygen concentration is available for neurons to metabolize, as well as glia and endothelial cells, that turns off the Krebs cycle or turns it down a bit because those pathways, the Krebs cycle itself is glycolytic, but it, as soon as you start reducing oxygenation, you end up with a lactic production, which lowers the pH. And low pH, we know, is bad for the brain. Certainly a brain can tolerate a low pH specifically, but in the setting of ischemia or other injury to it, a brain that is more acidotic at the time of injury is going to do worse compared to a brain that has normal pH. The resulting effect is a lowering in ATP concentration, less cellular uh, energy available for doing what it does. Um, but the amount of reduction in ATP specifically is not as bad as it is if you get rid of glucose itself because you still have the anaerobic pathways working in the brain in the setting of hypoxemia, pure hypoxemia. So what states do you see that in? Someone who is in respiratory distress, a, a patient who has suddenly had an aspiration, has lowered their oxygen level but their blood pressure is kept fine, somebody with cyanide toxicity, or uh, methemoglobinemia, for example. Pretty uncommon states specifically. But we've all known and seen patients in the ICU who have had chronic lung disease who are quite hypoxemic, who actually cerebrate normally, even though their partial pressure of oxygen is close to being on Mount Everest. So hypoxemia is bad, but it's not as bad as ischemia. So when you have ischemia, 
a reduction in arterial pressure, or perhaps an increase in venous pressure so that the gradient is reduced, as you would see in sinus thrombosis, for example. Now you have a reduction in oxygen and glucose, and that's bad for the brain because not only does it affect your, your glycolytic pathways, but there's no substrate now for the glycolysis at all. Lactate production is still present because of the existing glucose that's there and a subsequent drop in pH, but the brain gets even more acidemic. In addition, ATP simply turns off. And in global ischemia, you rapidly lead to no synaptic activity, influx of calcium, saponification of membranes, and cellular destruction. So in global states, which we would see in cardiac arrest, for example, the brain is very poorly tolerant to that. And we all know that because that's the basis for why we do CPR quickly. I guess at the last seminar, we feel that coding doesn't do anything to people, but um, we all know that certainly rapid defibrillation in the field for primary V-fib or V-tech is very effective at resuscitating brain, and the amount of downtime directly affects your outcome. So in global ischemia, where there is no flow to the brain, you can only tolerate it for a very brief period of time. Well, that's in the extreme. But ischemia, compared to hypoxemia itself, is much more injurious. Now, we usually put these together as hypoxia ischemia, uh, because if blood flow stops or the heart stops, you're not giving oxygen nor glucose to the brain, so they're together. And those outcomes end up with global encephalopathy, depending upon the degree of damage. Now, focal injury, um, I don't know if that, uh, that should animate, if you can click on it. Um, if in the setting of a embolic stroke, for example, that uh, closes a cerebral vessel, um, the main difference between ischemia in the setting of global ischemia and focal ischemia, looks like it doesn't uh, animate, that's fine, um, is that there is some degree of collateral flow. And if you have collateral flow to an area of brain, the absolute cerebral blood flow in that location is not zero or absent at all, there's some degree of continuing perfusion. That leads to the concept of a core infarct and the penumbra around the outside. Um, and in the earliest experiments of looking at the effect of cerebral blood flow in on the fate of neurons, the early primate experiments that were done in this cartoon figure, which uh, I think it still holds up quite well today, we can think of three clinical scenarios we see all the time. We can have an embolus block a vessel, blood flow reduce, to a certain level, stay that point for a bit, and then endogenous uh, TPA and other things lice the clot and it goes away. If that lowering of blood flow doesn't hit that ischemic threshold, no one's the wiser. The patient himself has no symptoms, there's no brain injury, um, yet they've had an embolic event and threatened their perfusion. And that's because cerebral blood flow has a large margin above what's necessary to maintain brain's health. So one has to cut it down to this typical 22 milliliters per gram of tissue per minute before you start seeing cellular breakdown, or at least turning off of pathways. So here, as the embolus cuts down flow more, so it crosses that paralysis line, you end up with um, neurons which themselves are temporarily not working, but they're not below a threshold at which it causes tissue destruction, even if it went on for hours. This theoretically would be ATIA, especially if it landed in a part of the brain that was clinically relevant and you could observe the, the uh, neurologic de deficit. An ischemic stroke is going to happen when the blood flow reduces to a level below this line of, of causing cellular tissue destruction. And what's wonderful about a focal ischemia is it can go on for a while. So for example, at this ordinate at one and a half hours, that's where cells have started to cross this threshold of being ischemic to being infarcted. And that's where the core develops. And this is the period of time in which, before the ordinate point in blue, a TPA, revascularization therapies, et cetera, are helpful for the brain. And it's very interesting that the one and a half hour mark or so is about where these early primate experiments would suggest that that's where your maximum therapy is going to be for ischemic stroke. And I think another 10 years of this research will prove the same thing for endovascular therapy, that if you open a vessel within an hour of its closure, we can probably mitigate most brain injury. Yet our systems are quite slow about that so far. So the brain is very good at coupling metabolism. You all know that a neuron, when it metabolizes in a neuro, what we call the neurovascular bundle or the neurovascular unit, is the neurons themselves are radially oriented in cortex and neocortex, and along with that has developed a arteriole or small artery that perfuses that whole column 
of um, tissue. And that regulation that actually takes the metabolites from the neuron, which are probably adenosine, as adenosine goes from triphosphate to dimonophosphate and then as adenosine, can leave the neuron either directly from the neuron or through glia, finds its way down to the base of the neurovascular bundle and increases flow. That's the basis for bold imaging, for functional MRI, for some of the earliest experiments um, that showed how behavioral neurology could be coupled and imaged by uh, a very elegant research with xenon, with radioactive xenon scintography experiments to show how structure and function correlate. That basic unit that is a pH sensitive then very, very directly takes and, and maps and mag, excuse me, uh, meets cerebral metabolic rate with cerebral blood flow. So blood flow comes in when metabolism increases to provide more glucose and, and most importantly take away some of the waste products. And in addition, when metabolic activity decreases, blood flow is reduced. That coupling tells us a lot about the health of the brain. If the brain can match those two, and uh, without it going to the extremes, we can probably infer that the brain is relatively healthy. So what are some of the problems that we'll talk about today? Global ischemia I've already talked about in cardiac arrest. It certainly is relevant for ICP and herniation issues. If the ICP is too high, the, the box can't get perfusion, blood flow is cut off to the brain, it looks just like a cardiac arrest. But then there's this thing called herniation. Are they the same thing? Well, someone can blow their pupil and become unconscious, but are they actually lower level of consciousness because they've had a midbrain shift, as Alan Roper likes to talk about, of a three millimeter shift of the midbrain? Um, or are they actually comatose because their ICP is so high they're having global ischemia? It's kind of hard to tell, actually, when you first evaluate a patient. In one, pa one case, blood flow is reduced, in the other one, it's not. In one case, it's a tissue shift, in the other, it's a pressure phenomenon. Those two are hard to separate clinically. Subarachnoid hemorrhage. Why does a patient go into a coma when their aneurysm bursts? It's probably because they have cerebral circulatory arrest. Uh, for a short period of time, they actually have global ischemia in certain cases, the higher grade hemorrhages. Um, that's going on all the time. An ischemic stroke, we've already talked about, that the blood flow reduction, the degree of reduction, its duration determines cellular fate. And lastly, encephalopathy patients. If a patient comes in with altered mental status, that term we always love to get as a consult, um, is it because there's something really serious going on in the brain or is it a metabolic process? Odds are, to all comers, 90% plus, it's some metabolic process. If you knew that their cerebral blood flow was the same or was normal, you'd be able to say without much more neurology or other lab work to say that the patient's brain is probably safe. So one of the surrogates that we've used to get to blood flow, because we're most interested in flow but couldn't measure it until more recently, is to use brain oxygen as a surrogate. And the, and the hypothesis is that there's more delivery, more blood flow than the oxygen concentration is higher. So if you follow oxygen concentration um, by a number of different methods, which will be reviewed in detail by Dr. Kofke, um, you will be able to say that blood flow is adequate. But there's some caveats to that, and they're numerous. One is that you're, you're not able to distinguish between dissolved and hemoglobin-bound oxygen, so that, for example, when a patient has a sudden change in pulmonary function, for example, they aspirate or there's some uh, VQ mismatch that occurs or a new right-to-left shunt, the first thing that changes is brain oxygen, but blood flow hasn't changed to the brain at all. Now, Howard Jonas is going to talk a bit about why he wants to have both oxygen and flow, which I agree with, but I think we have to be careful about interpreting a drop in brain oxygen as something seriously related to blood flow, even though they're often collinear. It doesn't measure demand. Um, demand is the cerebral metabolic rate, and it's usually measured by CMRO2, which is a PET term primarily to look at oxygen extraction, and we're far from having that as a continuous monitor. So direct measures of cerebral blood flow follow the hypothesis that, well, um, if you have adequate cerebral blood flow, then the brain's healthy. Now, it might be reversibly pathologic from an encephalopathy of some kind, but if blood flow is okay, whatever you're doing is probably okay. And if it's low, maybe you can do things to augment it, like raise MAP, um, lower intracranial pressure, et cetera. But I think there, it's, it's a true statement as a, I think it's a true 
well, any hypothesis is true until proven false, but I think it's a good theory um, with a fewer, a fewer caveats. It doesn't tell us about cerebral metabolic rate. I, too, am a believer in oxygen extraction fraction, which is a very useful term, and again, Dr. Jonas will go into that in some detail. Our PET, sort of the gold standard for measuring that, we don't as yet have non-invasive monitors that can give us that. But I think by measuring cerebral blood flow, you're one step closer. So an ischemic stroke, it can help us with diagnosis. Actually, your neurologic exam is much better than any image, in my opinion, but um, it certainly can tell you if one half of the brain isn't getting blood flow and the other one is, it doesn't take much science to know what's happening. We can also tell you about vessel reperfusion, which is critical for revascularization therapies, or restenosis or reocclusion of vessels. And it may tell you something about your ability to augment collateral flow. So if you have a middle cerebral artery occlusion in a patient in whom there's been no intervention, what am I supposed to do with the mean arterial pressure? We all stop their be your beta blockers and everything else and let their pressure rise with permissive hypertension, but does it help? Wouldn't it be nice to know that by doing those things that you're doing, putting the patient more flat, for example, giving them a bolus of fluid, that you're actually helping collateral flow or you're not? If you had a monitor that you could monitor penumbra, you'd be able to say that actually those things are helpful or they're not, but currently we don't have that. What about cardiac arrest? If you had a blood flow monitor to the brain during CPR, you'd know how hard to push, right? And we've all seen this too, the difference between the, the tall, strong guy who's got tremendous force and somebody who might not have their body weight doing CPR, uh, and those two are not the same. But do you, could you have a feedback actually to truly a blood pressure or blood flow during CPR during resuscitation? Well, obviously, we're not going to do anything invasive to measure that. We need something that's readily available. Would it make a difference in outcome? Maybe. Um, but I think what it will really tell you is that once you've got return of spontaneous circulation, that knowing what happens to cerebral blood flow after the heart's restarted is probably prognostically useful. And that's going to require a continuous measure, some degree of monitoring to determine whether someone's blood flow increases and then slowly decreases, or it never increases at all because of the no reflow phenomenon, a phenomenon we've known about for, for decades, but have never been able to see in practice. So I think there's an outcome prediction piece. I've already talked about being able to, to clinically tell the difference between someone who is unconscious with a third nerve palsy, who you wonder has had temporal lobe herniation from their epidural hematoma, their temporal lobe bleed, or whatever, or is it because they now have obstructive hydrocephalus and aren't perfusing their brain, but the first thing that got damaged was the third nerve. So can you tell the difference between those two? In one, you want to lower ICP, and the other, you want to get rid of the mass. You probably want to do both in both of those cases, but what is your priority? How much, how, what was the response to mannitol when I gave it? Did their cerebral blood flow improve? And what do I do with the blood pressure? If I crank up blood pressure, as Dr. Jonas again will talk about, having the ability to perturb the system raise pressure, do something, and look at the delta effect on cerebral blood flow is something clinically meaningful, I believe. Uh, but again, that requires the ability to record it. Subarachnoid hemorrhage with vasospasm is a challenge we all face in trying to understand if the spasm we see on TCD is clinically relevant. It's no problem in a hunt has two patients who can actually give you a history and you can do an exam, but what about a grade four, grade five patient in whom um, uh, his very encephalopath because of their blood, and we're not sure if the TCD velocity in the left middle cerebral is symptomatic or not, because they're not speaking anyway or they're intubated. I can't tell if that's a relevant clinically for spasm, and more, more importantly, if I then raise their blood pressure and their cerebral blood flow changes or doesn't change, am I doing things that are helpful or potentially harmful? I would pause, I would state that heretofore we have been shooting in the dark with almost all of these therapies. And I think we're all well-intentioned to do the right thing, but I'm not sure that what we're doing in any way can be the right thing without some degree of monitoring. And then lastly, something our colleagues in the emergency department deal with all the time. If somebody comes in who has normal blood flow to the brain but is encephalopathic, I posit that is a different patient than a patient who is not cerebrating well, who has lower flow. So there's two different populations. Yes, a CT scan is gonna be extremely helpful in that setting, but would this also be another monitor we would apply simply like blood pressure, heart rate, temperature, respiratory rate, and brain blood flow, a fifth vital sign, if you want to say, to triage patients?